Hey everyone, Pastor Ty here in Ann Arbor. And today we're going to be talking about discovering your superpower. Which one would you want, by the way? I'm sure you've thought about it. I know that I have. I've considered, okay, which superpower would I like to have? Well, there is actually a right answer to that question, which we will get to here in just a little bit. A couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of participating in the graveside service of one of our church folks who's 90 plus years old. Her name is Joanne Snyder. And Joanne absolutely had a, a superpower, if you will, that everybody who ever encountered her experienced it. I and another pastor were officiating, and as part of the service, the family had asked us if we would have an open mic sharing time where different family members could come up to the mic or just stand in front of everybody and talk a little bit about their memories. Now, normally I don't like open mic times because very quickly things can go sideways. People can start sharing weird or meaningless stories that just go on far too long. But in this case, it was amazing. Each person who got up to talk said something beautiful and kind of similar about Joanne. They talked a bit about her superpower. It was truly a unique thing. The best way I can describe it is there's this story in ancient Jewish history scrolls called Samuel where there's this sort of crabby king named Saul and he has told his soldiers that nobody is allowed to eat until they've completely defeated their enemy. And so, as you might imagine, marching and soldiering uh, develops an appetite. And so these guys were famished and in a weakened state. And as they were traveling through a forest, they saw some honey on the ground, but they knew that if they ate it, they would be cursed and potentially killed by King Saul. Well, a little while later, not having seen or heard any of Saul's uh, vow, Jonathan, Saul's son, went through that same forest and saw the honey. And so he ate some of the honey. A little while later, Saul found out that somebody had eaten honey and there was kind of this whole moment where it seemed like even when Saul found out that Jonathan had eaten the honey, he felt compelled to carry out his vow and maybe even to kill his own son. It's a, it's a crazy story. Well, while the other soldiers all kind of rise up and say, no, 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 Saul, don't harm Jonathan. He's, he's this wonderful guy, whatever. And so Jonathan's life is spared. But, but the little detail in this story that always had sort of popped out to me was the way that the honey was described. When Jonathan talked about the honey, he said that he tasted it and it brightened his eyes. It brightened his eyes. The, the best way that I can describe Joanne is that she was like that honey in a way. In a weary world full of angry people ready to pounce, ready to even kill, an encounter with Joanne brightened the eyes. So much so that her son-in-laws, her grandson-in-law, all got up and said, we can't even make the typical mother-in-law jokes about her because she was so, so special, because she used her superpower for good. So. What was it about her that brightened the eyes? Well, I'll tell you here in just a little bit. We've been talking about wisdom. Wisdom, which is understanding and insight and resolve. Wisdom is what happens when you start with fearing God, tr truly being humble, and repenting, and recognizing that he's God and you're not. Wisdom is how you learn to live in this world under God's rule, living in God's way. And so we've been talking about wisdom. And the book of Proverbs specifically is where we have landed. It was a little bit of a, a study guide, if you will, to the ancient Jewish folks. And this man named Solomon, considered to be the wisest man who ever lived, this man named Solomon taught people, here's how you live. Here's the art of living. And as you look through Proverbs, you see that there are some long poems, but there's also a number of themes that come out in these smaller verses, in these just sort of like one-liners. Well, one of the themes that comes out is friendship, which we talked about last week. Friendship is this important thing that oftentimes gets put on the back burner, but is so critical to us living, flourishing lives. So we talked about friendship, and one scholar even said that Proverbs was like a treatise on friendship. 
Well, there's another theme in Proverbs that comes out even more than friendship, and that is the theme that we're looking at today. It is, well, it's that we all have a superpower. Now, I'm going to read part of a proverb to you. Now, maybe you've heard this before, so you know how to fill in the blank, or maybe you've met Joanne before, so you just experienced this. But in Proverbs, Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, death and life are in the power of, and then let's just leave it blank. Death and life, so it's pretty big stuff here, are in the power of what? What might we say here to fill in the blank? Death and life are in the power of the king. Death and life are in the power of medicine. Death and life are in the power of wealth. Death and life are in the power of hard work. Death and life are in the power of education, right? Good old Ann Arbor. Death and life are in the power of friendships. I mean, all of those could make some sense, but that is not what it says here. If you read a little bit more context, here's what it says, and I'll give you what was in that blank. Let's back up to verse 20. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. One of the most consistent themes in this book of wisdom, in the Proverbs, is that if you want to learn to live, you must learn to control and to use your words for life rather than for death. Now, in a way, this can sound a little bit Uh, hyperbolic. I mean, this sounds a little extreme, like that words are that big of a deal. But if you go to the very beginning of the biblical scroll, right, the, the, the start of the library that we call the Bible, there is a story that talks very much about the power there is in speaking. It is the God of the universe who creates the heavens and the earth through speaking. Now, this brings us to our Bible nerd moment of the day. day. We've talked about this a little bit before, but at the very beginning, it says that the the earth was tohu vavohu. It was was formless and void. It was wild and waste. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, the word spirit here in Hebrew is ruach. Now, ruach can mean spirit, like, like we see it translated here. It can also mean Well, it has kind of a host, a a range of meanings, if you will. It can mean wind, breath, inspiration. It is this invisible creative power that is in the world. So when you see the trees move, there's something invisible and powerful moving the trees. That's Ruach. When you're sitting there and you're just like, hmm, and you're just kind of chilling, and then all of a sudden this idea comes to you, like invisibly this powerful idea comes to your mind, that's Ruach. When you're thinking about the Spirit of God, That is also the same word, ruach. So as you read the beginning of the creation story, the spirit is hovering. And as the the text describes what's happening, it says, and God said, right, his, his breath, God said, and as he does that, it's as if he's expelling and the spirit is like flowing out with God's words and it's creating life. And then God sees that it's good. And this pattern happens over and again. God says, his rock goes out, and God sees that it's good. God spoke life into existence. His very words brought life. But unfortunately, the story doesn't end with just beautiful creation. As you continue to read, there is a new force by chapter 3 that steps or, or slithers or arrives on the scene, and it's a serpent. And the serpent, and again, we've mentioned this before, but how does a serpent attack? Well, we would think, well, serpents bite. But, but no, in this case, the serpent goes to the first human beings and says something. And what he says is, did God really say, right? Like, did God really say? He starts to use his words to try to sow some seeds of doubt and ultimately even death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, even if you didn't know the creation story, in some small way, you've probably experienced that for yourself. 
that there have been times where somebody has spoken to you at just the right time or maybe at just the wrong time, in just the right way or maybe in just the wrong way, and it has done something significant in your life. Some of you can remember slights, jabs from a classmate, or dismissive comments by a coach or a teacher that were said years ago that are still creating some, some sort of pain, even maybe kind of death in your spirit, because you can remember those things that they said. Some of you have been in relationships and you can remember that moment where someone said the thing that had been unsaid. Maybe even they said something that was so destructive that it ended the relationship. We have experienced moments where words have stirred up pain and frustration and a type of death in us. And we've also, Lord willing, we've experienced really, really good things. We've experienced life. Like some of you have gone down a career path or, or a study path or whatever because somebody encouraged you. They spoke into your life and said, wow, you are really gifted at that. Some of you can remember the first time you ever heard your child say, I love you to you. Or, or, or you can remember when the nurse said, hey, it's a boy. Sometimes people speak and it can be, bring tremendous life. Life and death are in the power of words. So today, I want us to consider the opportunity of words, the misuse of words, and the aftermath of our words. So let's start first with the opportunity, the opportunity. Now, I didn't do the math myself. I, I, I looked it up and I read in a couple different places that human beings speak on average 16,000 words a day. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, I'm way under that, and I know somebody who's way over that, or whatever, right? But on average, humans speak about 16,000 words a day. Now, do you know how many words the average sermon has in it? The average sermon that, that Pat or Reagan or I, like, like one of our sermons, do you have any idea how many words there are in a typical sermon that we give. Now, time out before you start going too many words. Hey, those things hurt, all right? Life and death, right? But no, no, think about it. How many words would you think are in a typical 35 or whatever minute sermon that we give? If you're with somebody, go ahead, elbow them and tell them how many words you think there are. Well, the answer is right around 4,000, 4,000. I write out every word. It's about 12 to 13 pages most weeks. So I can quickly do a word count, which I did for the last three, four sermons right around 4,000 words, which means that all of you are giving four sermons every single day. About 50 pages worth of words are coming out of your mouth. And now listen, if during this sermon, which has 4,000 words, if I get 10 words twisted, there are some folks that will hear it, will become so offended that they will leave the church they will think I'm a bad person. Some people might even refuse to keep pursuing and investigating the faith because of the power of just a few of those 4,000 words. If you are giving four sermons a day, think about the opportunities that is there. It is not just the person with a microphone and a camera and a platform of some type that has power and opportunity in their words. Each of us, every single one of us has this opportunity. Our words can either wound or heal. Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Solomon describes our words like, like, a, bra uh, like a blade and that Running around with like a sword in your hand in a crowd would be a very dangerous thing to do if you're not sure if you want to hurt anybody or not. That our words have the ability to wound the people that are around us or to help and to heal them. Some of us think that nobody hears us or cares about what we say, but the truth is that our words are doing something to the people that are around us all the time. Our words can also stir or calm, Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I mentioned a phrase uh, last week, which has been very important and helpful to me, which is, can you help me understand? I, I one time had an incredibly angry man who was pacing in front of me and yelling at me. 
And he was so angry that although I was trying to understand what he was saying, I was also thinking, how am I going to receive the punch that he's clearly about to give me? And as he was kind of angrily going at me, at one point I just said, hey, listen, I, I am not sure I'm totally tracking. Would you, just, would you just take a seat and back up your story a bit? And would you just help me understand what's going on? And as soon as I said that to him, he went from pacing and anger to like sitting, a couple deep breaths and said, okay. And we were able to have a talk. Our words can either stir up, I could have made that situation much more dangerous and scary, or it can calm. The right word has real power. Our words can crush or lift. Proverbs 15, 4. The soothing tongue is the tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Have you ever been around somebody who is kind of perverted in the sense that they turn everything into something that it was never intended to be? They're like a, like a walking urban dictionary, you know, that somehow can define everything in like weird sexual terms. And you're just like, what? And when you're around them, that foolishness has a way of sort of seeping in and undermining your soul. Have you ever been around somebody like that? Have you ever been around somebody who's the opposite, who they just sort of see things differently and they speak a type of purity that, that, that when they talk at just the right time, they have a way of lifting people up and pointing them to Jesus in all circumstances. Those people are the best. Our words can, can crush or they can lift like the tree of life. Our words can stoke or soothe. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. When we are anxious, when things are falling apart, when we are unsure, we need people to speak into us. Last weekend, I was hanging out with my nine-year-old niece and my six-year-old nephew, and we were outside. Now, now, my nephew is from Southern California, so we were outside, and we were along the edge of some woods in kind of this overgrown field, and we were picking these berries that were growing there in the wild, Southern dewberries to be exact. I had to look it up to make sure they were safe. And as we were picking the berries, all of a sudden, my nephew looked up at me with his big brown eyes and his voice shaking, and he said, I just heard a rattlesnake. Run for your lives. And when he said it, I, I, my initial reaction was, no, you didn't, buddy. And I just went back and he goes, no, Uncle Ty, seriously, I just heard a rattlesnake. Run for your lives. And I looked at him, and he was quaking with fear, and he was beginning to get ready to just take off on a dead sprint. And when he said that, I said, oh, oh, okay, buddy, I'm taking you seriously. Now, let's just stop and let's just look around to see what we can see. And as we do that, I want you to tell me when you hear it again. Don't move now. Let's just listen. Tell me when you hear it again. And I want you to understand, we are in Michigan, which means we only have one kind of rattlesnake. And it's pretty small and it's very shy. I've never seen one out here, so I don't think that's what it was. But tell me what you hear. And shaking, he said, uh, that. And he was referring to a noise that I heard, which as soon as I heard it, I knew it wasn't a snake. I said, oh, that's, that's a type of bug. That, that's a cicada. Like, it makes that kind of noise. And he said, well, couldn't there be other kinds of snakes here? And I said, well, yes, in Michigan we have other snakes, but the only venomous one is a small, shy rattlesnake who you're not hearing right now. That's actually a bug. And as I talked to him, he began to just like visibly calm down and everything was fine. Now listen, He's a smart kid who does a lot of hiking in Southern California where there are rattlesnakes. His experience was, in that moment, his anxiety was based on a legitimate concern. Now, it was a concern that wasn't present, but it was legitimate. Now, think about when anxiety begins to rise up in us, sometimes over incredibly legitimate concerns and fears. But sometimes we need somebody who's there with us to take us seriously, to say, I hear you, I get it, I think we will be okay, but even if it isn't okay, I'm still here. Our words can incite anger and it can, it can stir up anxiety or it can soothe. There is an incredible opportunity that we have been given. We've been given a superpower with our words and with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you, Uncle Ben from, from Spider-Man or Churchill or Roosevelt or Voltaire or whoever it was that said it first. But we have this super. Now, earlier I asked you, 
Which superpower would you want if you could have anyone? And then I went on to say, there is a right answer to this question, and there is actually. So, so which superpower would you want if you could pick one? The right answer is, I want the superpower that I wouldn't misuse. That's actually the right answer. See, because normally when we're dreaming about what superpower we want, we assume that we would use it for good. But why are we assuming that? Because many of the superpowers that we can think of, we would probably misuse. If I had x-ray vision, I would misuse it. If I had the ability to create storms, I would misuse it. If I could read thoughts, I would misuse it. If I could be invisible, I would misuse it. In fact, I can't think of anything good I would do with invisibility. I would misuse that kind of power. Listen, we have been given a superpower and we continually misuse it. So there's an opportunity, but there's also misuse, which brings us to part two, the misuse. Now the question that I have for us as we consider the misuse of words is why? If we know that misusing our words can harm our finances, our friendships, our families, our communities, our very lives, why do we misuse them? Like, like what is it that prompts us to speak up when we should probably just stay silent? Which prompts us to, to brag when we should sit down, be humble, right? Which, which prompts us to tell lies when we should tell the truth. Which prompts us to get angry and have an outburst when we should chill. Which prompts us to mock people when we should bless people. What is it that makes controlling the tongue so difficult for us? Well, the churchy answer is, it's true, that's a little churchy and it's maybe too thin, is to simply say, uh, sin. Sin is the reason why we misuse our mouths. And that's true. We have a soul cancer called sin, which symptoms include foulness of mouth. That is true. Just on a surface level, that's true. But let's just go just a little bit deeper back to that creation story here for just a second. Go back. Think about the creation story, the very first humans on earth. Now, if you haven't heard the story before, it's okay, but the very first sin that was ever committed was in some ways a mouth sin. Like literally, they ate some forbidden fruit. Now, why? God had given them many, many things to eat, and yet they were tempted to eat this one thing. Why did they sin with their mouths in the garden there. What was it? Now, as they talked to the serpent, the serpent began to question them in a certain way. And what we find out is that, well, they thought if they used their mouths in this way, that they would get something for themselves, that they would become more like God, that they would, in a way, that they would get life. They were not trying to bring on death. They were actually trying to secure more life for themselves. When I think about the times that I've misused words, or, or just generally, when I think about how I can often misuse my words, a lot of it is because of the same reasons why they failed. So when I misuse my words, my motivation in speaking might be to say something that makes me appear to be funny or clever or bright. I was in a Zoom class last week, a doctoral Zoom class, with a bunch of brilliant people. And I sat there listening, but sometimes I was only kind of listening because what I was really doing was thinking about what am I going to say when I'm called on that will make me seem funny or clever or bright. When I'm doing that, when I was doing that last week, I was missing at times what other people were saying. I was missing opportunities to bless and encourage people. I wasn't trying to sow seeds of death, but I also wasn't trying to sow seeds of life. I was trying to get life for myself. When I misuse my words sometimes, my motivation for speaking is that I'm trying to manipulate situations. I might be a little bit extra charming or flattering or something because what I'm trying to do is 
get things to go a certain way for me. I'm trying to get my own life and create it by just doing and saying and intimidating and tweaking and whatever I need to, to use my words to get some. I'm not, I'm not thinking in those moments, oh, I'm trying to sow seeds of death. I'm not, I'm not thinking about the death. I'm thinking about trying to get life. So sometimes when I misuse my words, my motivation is simply to complain or to vent. Perhaps I'm a little bit tired or frustrated, or maybe I've done such a good job for a really long time with my words and being self-controlled that I'm just tired of being good. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before, but there's times where I'm just like, oh, I just gotta get this off of my chest. I just gotta say this thing. Now, when I do that, all I'm trying to do is blow off some steam so I'll feel better. I am not thinking about sowing death. I'm thinking about just getting a little bit more life for me. See, in every one of those situations, the reality is I am speaking for me. I'm trying to get life rather than give life. And whether or not I realize it, in those moments, I am listening to the serpent say, Ty, surely you won't die. Just the opposite. The better you look in their eyes, the better you feel, the better you get things to turn your way, the more you will be like God. So use those words. Make that joke. Vent a little. It will be good for your soul. <laughs> right? Why do we misuse them? Well, we misuse them because sometimes we're listening more to the serpent than we are to the spirit. There is something off in us. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus was confronted by some uptight religious types. And right after he had beautifully and compassionately healed somebody, they were saying horrible things about him. And as he was teaching and confronting them, frankly, he says this, and this is brutal. Now, this is the message, which is a paraphrase translation, but I just want you to hear it uh, in, in a very easy to understand language. This is what it says in Matthew 12. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. When Jesus confronted them, he wanted them to know that the way that they were talking was more than just a simple little misuse, just a mistake. No, no. It was revealing something about the state of their hearts and their souls. You have to imagine the lovely Scottish brogue of Alistair Begg, when I say this, because this is his line, not mine, but he said, you know a metal by its tinkle, you know a man by his talking. These verses aren't saying that you're saved or condemned based on the words you say. What it's saying is that the words you say give a type of evidence, a testimony to what's going on in your heart and your soul. So that when we misuse our words, we know that it's actually a heart problem. Something is off underneath. So there's an opportunity with our words. Unfortunately, we misuse our words, which brings us to part three, the aftermath, the aftermath. So my question here is now what? If we have this superpower that we regularly misuse and it's telling the world, certainly it's telling God just how messed up our hearts can be, then not only are we bad at being superheroes, we might even be supervillains in a sense. So, so, so where does all of this leave us? Now, I think I've mentioned this before, but I find something in the Bible here utterly poignant when it comes to how we use our words. Of all the places where we use words, where do we use the most words? Now, you might think, well, work, you know, whatever. But for many of us, the place where we use most of our words is in our homes, right? I mean, certainly our families have heard a lot from us. It might even be that it's in our homes where we have misused our words more than anywhere else. Now, th this I think is kind of interesting because if it's our parents and kids and, and siblings and spouses that hear most of our words and certainly with whom we misuse our words the most, what I find so interesting is that wh where in the Bible is the longest teaching on how we use our words? Do you know? You might think, well, Proverbs. I mean, that's what we're saying. Well, there's a lot of teaching on our words in Proverbs, but it's mostly kind of spread out in small sayings. Where is the longest continuous chunk of verses about how difficult it is to manage this opportunity of our tongues and to control 
our words? Well, the answer to that question, I think, I haven't done the math, but I'm pretty sure, is in the New Testament. It's in a book called James. For almost an entire chapter, almost the whole of chapter 3, James waxes eloquent on the difficulty of taming the tongue and the importance of using this superpower correctly. And in the very beginning of James, if you're like, well, who is James? At the beginning, he tells us who he is. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that seems like a fairly standard intro to a Bible letter, right? Like a servant of God or whatever. So the fact that James is the one that spends a lot of time talking about talking might not move the needle very much for us if all we know about him is found in that first sentence. Well, do you know anything else about that, James? If you're like, well, there seems like a lot of James in the Bible. Yeah, there are. There's, a bunch, there's some people, like certain names in the Bible that we find all over the place. But this James, the James that wrote the book of James, is believed to be Jesus' younger brother, who for years did not believe in Jesus as his Savior. Did you know that? So, so for many years, James may have said incredibly cruel things about his brother Jesus and maybe even to his brother Jesus. There's this one little verse in Mark, Mark chapter 3, 21, when Jesus' family hears what Jesus is doing, and it says, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Now, if tradition is correct, James is the second oldest brother. He would, outside of Jesus, he would have been like the oldest of the family. He may have been the one. He may have been the one who said, Jesus is out of his mind. I mean, he had all, probably a whole list of horrible things that he could probably recall that he had leveled at Jesus at some point. He had misused his superpower against the very Son of God, the one who's described as the Word of God made flesh. And yet we know Jesus came to this earth among a bunch of foul-mouthed people to live perfectly among us. And, and, and despite the constant barrage of poisonous barbs that were launched at Jesus through words from the religious types and all kinds of people, including Jesus' own family, Jesus responded perfectly every time. He taught brilliantly the love of God. And ultimately, he even laid down his very life and died on a cross and then resurrected so that liars, braggers, manipulators, insulters, sinners, killers like James, like us, might ultimately be forgiven and maybe find life. Jesus gave his life. And some of you, you know, you thought, you've thought about this before. If you heard sermons from us before, you've certainly heard us talk about, oh, Jesus died and rose again, and that's a big deal, right? Like, you've heard that. I want you to think about something. When Jesus was resurrected, where, if he went to you and says, hey, uh, where should I go? Who should I visit first? What would you have said? I mean, if you'd asked me, I would have been like, um, let's see, what's the list? Uh, where's Pilate? Where's Herod? Where's Caesar? Maybe you should go to those power players and you should say, hey, I heard you've been talking about me. Uh, what's up now? Right? Like that would have made sense to go visit those people or maybe to go to the temple and be like, hey, 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 hey stop all the sacrifices. I got that covered. Worship me, guys. Like that, that would have made sense. And yet after Jesus resurrected, where did he go? Well, he appeared to a couple people who seemingly were his followers, but they were kind of confused and they were sort of doubting. Their hearts were sort of burning in them the whole time he went to them. Uh, he visited a couple sort of individual of his followers. He visited like some small groups of his followers. Where else did he go? Well, he also went and to one person in particular who had probably said incredibly cruel things about him. Have you ever noticed this before? In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Whoa! Did you hear it? There was a moment when the risen Jesus went out 
and appeared to his brother, who as far as we can tell, did not believe in Jesus up until that very moment. Can you imagine what that moment was like? When the risen Jesus appears to James? I mean, I, I was thinking about that, and I was just thinking, I could almost see James just being like, Jesus? Oh my God. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't even, I didn't know. I said these, I, I didn't, and I can almost just hear Jesus being like, shh, I did know James, and I loved you anyway. And, and I want you still. Follow me. See, James' life was totally changed by the risen Christ. So much so that when you asked him who he was, when he signed off on his letters, do you know how he signed it? Servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Being confronted by the, by the God who forgives, by the God who accepts, by the God who gives away his life, was the way that James went from trying to get life from his words to realizing how important it was to give life with his words. It is only an encounter with the risen Jesus that can change us like that. And guess what? Here, this is what's so awesome. Outside of that one verse in Mark 3 that I read about his family, thinking he's crazy, whatever, and we said, maybe that was James. James' name isn't in that verse. And outside of the fact that we think, wow, siblings can say some mean things, the only words that we know for sure that James ever said are all contained in his letter, which points to the glory and the beauty of Jesus. See, even his mouth, his tongue, his use of words was redeemed. That he had, may have used it or misused his power in the past, but Jesus was going to use it for his glory. And we can be the recipients of that, the beneficiaries of the blessing of James' words now thousands of years later. The same Spirit of God who was there in the creation, who raised Jesus from the dead, who rescued James, is still in the life-giving business today. Some of us, you might have some repenting to do, if we're honest. Some of us might recognize that there are some moments where we have blown it. And when we think about our words, we, we, we understand just how off our hearts can be. And so for some of us, today can be the day for the first time that we recognize that Jesus is alive. He will forgive you, and he still wants you, and he's here to empower you with his very spirit. Now, for those of us who've already done that. You know, we've come to that place of repenting for our words in so many other ways that we've sinned, and we've, we've called on God for mercy. For those of us in that camp, notice what Jesus does at the end of John. This is, this is really fascinating. This is not one of those verses we read a lot, but it's really, it's really fascinating. John 20, 21. Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The Ruach in the Hebrew Old Testament, the Pneuma in the Greek New Testament, the Spirit of God is given to Jesus' followers. So that if you are a follower of Jesus today, you are being empowered and called to use your words to give life, not to try to get it for yourself. So this week, pray for someone. Pray for someone. Think of somebody right now that you would love to see God breathe new life into. Pray for them today. This week, encourage someone. Th think about somebody, maybe, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member, to whom you could say some life-giving, encouraging words. We, we'd sort of prompted people to do this in, an, in another message that we had last week, and I got some amazing life-giving notes this week from people. So who is the person that comes to mind that you can encourage this week? This week, share the story of Jesus with somebody. Who is in your sphere of influence that you might be given an opportunity to speak Jesus' life into? This week, use your words to give life. Use this superpower. Our words are gifts that we have misused, but the risen Jesus can redeem 
and rescue those words if we use them for his glory. I was standing back at the, at the service, the graveside service for Joanne, and uh, the other pastor stood up to close the service after the sharing time. And he said something that stuck with me, and I've just been kind of stewing on it ever since. I, it was getting a little later in, in, in the morning, almost getting to afternoon. It was pretty hot. I was starting to sweat. I was kind of looking at my watch. I was thinking, man, why did I wear a jacket? You know, all those kind of things. And as he was talking, right after the last person shared, he said, did you hear the theme? Did, did you hear what everybody seems to be saying? And that is that Joanne was a person of prayer, a person dedicated to scripture, a person dedicated to encouraging. She was a person who used her words to bring life to everyone around her. And this is what he said that caught me. He said, today, this world has less words of prayer being sent up, less words of encouragement being given, less words of scripture being recited over people because Joanne's not here with us anymore. So he said, who of you will pick up her mantle? Who of you will take that on yourself and carry that forward to the other people that are around us? We need you in this world to give life through Holy Spirit empowered words. Well, we are about to enter into a time of music as we continue our worship to God. We would just encourage you to use this time for reflection and admiration toward God. But before we get into that, we have a couple of quick announcements. Mm -hmm. We have two in-person services this Sunday. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. And there are so many things going on at GBC right now, including Grace Group sign up, men's ministry info, and women's retreat info, and so much more. The details on everything happening at GBC can be found in The Loop, which is our e-newsletter. The Loop is the best way to stay up to date, and you may subscribe to it at graceA2.org slash loop. And finally, here at Grace Bible Church, we believe that giving is an act of worship. So you may give online at graceA2.org slash give, or by mailing your offering to our 1300 South Maple Road address. Matt, would you lead us in a benediction? Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father God, you have given us the gift of words. You've given us the opportunity to, to speak life into our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I pray that we would just truly cherish that gift and use it well um, and just really pour into those around us in our community, in our family, and in this church. Uh, as we worship, I pray that we really just meditate on the words of this song and, and truly just go to you and, and lay everything at your feet in this time as, as we just uh, come to you in song and with gratefulness and with joy. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. 
has no claim. 